It starts with an electric crowd powered by Whiteout Energy. It's like nothing in all of sports, let alone college football. It continues with a rushing attack, flexing their muscles and imposing their will. Second quarter, um, them boys are starting to get worn out. And it concludes with the defense squeezing the fight out of the Illini. Time to recap another victory and break down the Bruins. This is Nittany Game Week. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Nittany Game Week. I'm Todd Sadowski alongside former Nittany Lions coaches Jake Paterno and Tom Bradley. The Big Ten opener for Penn State is a flex on Illinois. The Nittany Lions control the line of scrimmage and outmuscle the 19th ranked team in the country. No, it was impressive. And, you know, the thing about it is they committed the run game. They made sure they controlled the tempo of the game, which kept Penn State's defense off the field. And they made the plays when they had to. That's the best defense in the world when you're sitting on the sideline watching them run the ball. You know, do it again. And the great thing about watching them run the ball was it was a lot of BYOB, be your own blocker. They were running over people. It was, it was impressive for sure. The offensive line says, look out, we're coming through. The defense squeezes the fight out of the Illini. And not everything is special in the third phase of the game in our opening drive. The crowd electric and definitely a factor in the game. Second, impressed with how physical Penn State was in the running game. Look at Nick Singleton deliver the hit to the safety filling the hole. I think no question. I think the key to this game was the controlling it on offense, but also not giving up the big play on defense, which led to the sequence before the half where Illinois comes away with no points. If they had scored there, it's 14-7, different ball game in the second half. And it allows the offense to wear down Illinois, and they really did, Tom. And that's what they did, but what the point Jay made was a great one. When they don't score, and now we got those points, now we can continue to play the game we want to play. We're not worried about scoring. We just want to control the ball because our defense is playing great. As an offensive coordinator, Jay, you always want to hear the offensive linemen calling for more run plays because they know they're controlling the other team. They pound Illinois with a full steam ahead approach. Right before we go out, we know they're about to punt the ball, about to get the ball back. We hype each other up, we get them going, we tell them we're going to keep, you know, keep the total on and we're just going to keep dominating. With Coach K, like, you know, most things are a surprise, but we as an offensive line knows that he trusts us. You know. He knows what we're capable of, and we just got to go out there and perform. Like, you know, during the fourth quarter, we knew, again, it could be a fourth-quarter game. Um, you get to tell the online line we had a different – they had a different mentality, you know, going on to the field, you know. They already told each other, like, you want to take over this game, um, finish this game off the right way, which they did too, you know, making them big holes for us. So it just made our job easy. Over 230 yards on the ground, Illinois boarded the plane back to Champaign with some serious bumps and bruises. Well, you know, the great thing about it is it does set a tone, and you're going to need that when you go to places like Minnesota in, the, in November. You're going to need it when you play a team like USC a week from now where they've got a great offense, and that's a good way to keep them off the field. And one of the great things offensively with your mindset, when you can do that to a defense, it kills the defense. Now, this game was quickly 7-7. Gave the illusion it would be a big night for the offense. It's not the case. Much like the Bowling Green game, the Nittany Lions defense, Tom, really squeezes them in the second half. Yeah, they sure did. I mean, they did. there was nowhere to go. And the great thing about it was that front four controlled the game. Now the line, they're, they're taking care of everything, and then the linebackers are just flowing. It was, it, was, it was a really special effort. It was fun to watch. Physical and offense with the rushing attack. Physical with the defense against the team that pushed them around a couple of years ago. Uh, upholding the standard as a defense because knowing what, we did, what they did to us my freshman year of 2021, how much yards they ran on us, we didn't want that to happen again. And uh, they had some good backs, bigger backs, and uh, – we just attacked them. The Kobe King with a long memory of that loss in Beaver Stadium. It's a two-for-one kind of show this week. Praise for the offense and defense, but there are some areas that need improvement as you move closer to a road game at USC and Ohio State looming in the distance. Too many penalties, and they need more consistency from the kicking game, Jack. you got to start to make those field goals and get those points because that kept Illinois in the game. And, again, that's something you can you got to get worked out. Uh, the penalties, no question about it. You had the pick six, and a guy makes a really careless, undisciplined block in the back, 10 yards behind the play. And you got to get those things worked out. Six penalties for 63 yards against Penn State. Illinois punted four times. Zero return yards for Penn State. Sander Sahedak missed the two field goals. Those can swing momentum big time in a game, especially when it keeps it a one-score game instead of a two-score lead. 
The Nittany Lions now ranked seventh in the country. Go for win number five on the season when they host UCLA. A breakdown of the Bruins and a roadmap to stay undefeated when we come back. You're watching Nittany Game Week. Roadmap to Victory is sponsored by the R&R family of companies. Well, welcome back to Nittany Game Week. Penn State is in a West Coast state of mind the next few games. They travel to Southern California next week for a big showdown in the L.A. Coliseum with USC. And this week, they welcome the visitors from the left coast to Happy Valley. UCLA is in the house. It's going to be a little strange to see the Bruins on the opposing sideline, especially for our very own Coach Bradley. Yeah, former UCLA assistant over here for a couple yeah, years. Yeah, it's a little, little different when you go from College Avenue to Pacific Coast Highway <laughs> and Route 10. There's some pretty good sunsets out there. But let's talk about UCLA coming here. That's one of the neat things about the Big Ten with their expansion. UCLA has not been here since 1967. Penn State lost the number four Bruins and Heisman Trophy winner Gary Beeman, but did not lose another game for almost three years. Started off a great run. But let's talk about tough runs for the Bruins. Look who they've played so far. The last three opponents are all currently ranked teams. Then you look at now they come to Penn State. They also have to go to Rutgers. And the time zone difference, this will be their fourth different time zone for five games. The offense, it kind of looks like it's really kind of affected their offense. They're having trouble getting points and those kind of things, Tom. Not what they're used to. And then let's talk a little bit about the players to watch. Their quarterback, Ethan Garbers, do not fall asleep on this guy. I know UCLA is struggling. But he's put up some good numbers and put up some big wins as a starter. He sure has. And one of the things you want to watch, he's very accurate. If he gets off to a hot start, look out. Yep. And let's talk about hot. You mentioned hot throws. Eric Bieniemy, the offense coordinator, loves to release backs into the flat and throw hot Penn State blitzes. Somebody's got to account for them because, again, LSU, let's take a look at these two plays in a row. LSU runs these. And, and they come with the blitz, and the ball's out, and Tom, that's a problem out there in the open field. <laughs> it's a lot of problem with no one's covering them, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and the thing I think you got to realize is when you're playing a team like UCLA, you got to look and show your team what they're best at, their best moments. They hung with LSU for three quarters on the road in Death Valley, and that's not an easy place to do. Now, off of those things, when they start to release the backs, now they want to get, Tom, you know, those linebackers off and start chasing the back, and what's that do now behind them? Well, a couple of things it does behind them, it creates open lanes for the throwing lanes for the thing. And also, the one thing it does, too, this quarterback doesn't have the time. He gets some scramble lanes. Yeah, absolutely. So now he, he gets a touchdown off that against LSU. And then now, the third match that Tom just talked about, the, the scramble situations. You know, you get into a situation where now you've got to stay in your run lane. They have given up a lot of pressure, but this guy does a good job. If you don't get him down, he can step up and make plays. They've given up 12 sacks, but take a look at how he moves here and gets a play down the field on this one. He did two, this two or three times against LSU. And now when he steps up, Tom, I know as a secondary coach, that frustrates the heck out of Oh, yeah, that really makes it, <laughs> it really makes for a fun evening. <laughs> So let's talk about them defensively. Again, they played Indiana, Oregon, and LSU, all of whom are really, really good offensive teams. So these numbers are going to be a little skewed a little bit. But one of the things they do is they'll talk, they'll, they'll be real aggressive on the outside with your DBs. And when they're out aggressive on the outside playing zone, it gives you some windows inside here. And you got to find those windows in a hurry. And LSU's guy does a great job, and Drew Allard's going to do the same thing, Tom. I I think it's going to. Be, I think the one thing that's the difference is that offensive line for Penn State is playing very well right now. They're going to protect Drew. They give yeah. him time. Drew should have an exciting night. Yeah, absolutely, and that's been the problem. Here again, trouble with pass rush for UCLA. Quarterback's back there. He's got a one-on-one, -on -one. and again, they cover well, but without the pressure, the quarterbacks can make a really accurate throw, and it does not get much more accurate than this throw. I mean, there is nowhere to go with this ball. The guy does a great job, but without pass rush, without disrupting the throw, you can make that. And now you talk about in terms of getting the getting some push to make the quarterback move. They've had a hard time doing that, but if you're, they do that and you're a little late with the throw, they can make plays in the secondary. That's the thing. If you can protect them, okay, they're, 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 there's some things they'll find. Absolutely. So you got to get after them. And again, Penn State's got to protect them so they don't get into situations like this. And then special teams now become, an, it become a situation where UCLA is really good at punting. Their punter, Richter, has 13 punts, seven down inside the 20. 
no touchbacks. So what that means for you, Todd, is if this guy was on your scramble team for a golf <laughs> tournament, you'd have a lot of birdie putts and he'd never put it in this trap or the water. Love that backspin and the LA vibes. I can feel them from across the studio coming from Tom, just chilling over there for sure. Well, it's a big noon kickoff on Fox Sports against UCLA and not sure it will be full throttle for the crowd. And I don't know if that's needed against the Bruins. No doubt they brought the whiteout energy Coach Franklin was asking for against the Fighting Illini. Whether it was timeouts, whether it was false starts and penalties, whether it was bad snaps, we thought they had seven plays that were significant in the game. We're so thankful and appreciative for the fans and the environment we get here. It's like nothing in all of sports, let alone college football. We've seen the crowd wreak havoc with opponents before. Not sure I've ever seen it happen on a punt. They didn't get it snapped in time. Just an incredible advantage for Penn State. They'll need the crowd when the Buckeyes come to town November 2nd. While this year's team tries to stay unbeaten all year long, perhaps the best team in Penn State history was in the building. Kerry Collins, the QB, Kyle Brady, the tight end, and Kajana Carter, the star running back on the 94 undefeated Nittany Lions that won the Big Ten Championship and the Rose Bowl. They didn't get a shot to play Nebraska, but they featured a phenomenal roster that continued on to have a major impact in the NFL. Up next, he's a Super Bowl champion and a freelance photographer. Former Penn State wide receiver Jordan Norwood also has a special connection to this week's opponent, UCLA. Our impact interview is coming up after this. Impact interview is sponsored by the Pocono Mountains, where small town charm meets big adventures. Book your trip today by visiting PoconoMountains.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Nittany Game Week. It's time for our Impact interview. This week's guest is Jordan Norwood, and here's the list of credentials. It's impressive. Two-time Big Ten champion, finished his career as Penn State's third all-time leading receiver, played eight years in the NFL, most notably with the Browns and the Broncos, where he won the Super Bowl and set the record for longest punt return in Super Bowl history. Jordan, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. All right. Well, look, you moved to Penn State and went to high school and state college when your dad became an assistant coach for the Nittany Lions. This week, you and your family reconvene in Happy Valley. And it's look, you have a rooting interest both ways, right? Your dad is on the coaching staff for UCLA. So what kind of emotions do you think will hit you, your family and everyone involved with this particular matchup? Uh, it, it'll be an emotional one. Uh, we're all excited to back up to state college. It's been a while for um, for everyone, I think this is my dad, my dad's first time coaching back at State College um, against Penn State. Um, I'll be there in my Nittany Lion attire, uh, and I can't speak for the rest of the family, but uh, we're, all, we're all excited. Uh, you were not one of those four or five star guys that everybody wants, but certainly there was one coach in the country that thought you were a five star in his mind. But when you got here, you teamed up with another under the radar guy, Dion Butler. So both of you guys ended up in the NFL. What advice would you give to guys coming up with big dreams of their own? Yeah, I mean, I, you're you're exactly right. Myself and Dion and Dion were both, uh, you know, kind of undersized wide receivers that, uh, you know, bunked up. We were roommates our freshman year, along with Derek Williams and Justin King. Um, and I think that was a big part of it. Honestly, uh, Jay was having having guys around us that encouraged us and just, um, you know, reaffirmed our, um, you know, own thoughts that we can do this and that we belonged at this level of football. Um, actually, the previous wide receiver coach at Penn State before I got there, Kenny Carter, uh, during one of the, the camps, summer camps at Penn State, he pulled me aside and said, Jordan, you can play at this level. Um, and so that was like one of those moments in my life where as a as a 5'9", 150-pound wide receiver in, in in high school, I was like, okay, I mean, if if Kenny Carter is telling me that I'm good enough, then then maybe I am. So, um, you know, it takes a, a little bit of perseverance and your own willpower, but it also takes some good people around you and great coaches and teammates that are, are encourage, encouraging you uh, to keep going. Well, Jordan, you torched our secondary playing against you. You made us better, but you did get us quite a few times, and it did get Coach Paterno a little upset sometimes. But uh, you played with Michael Robinson. You won a Big Ten title at Penn State in 2005. Then you were part of the 2008 spread HD with offense with Daryl Clark that won another Big Ten title in 2008. How much fun was it playing with those guys and in that system? Oh, man, man, so much fun. Um... 
you know, 2004, uh, 2005 as, as youngsters, uh, you know, just kind of figuring out, you know, what the cap was going to be on our, on our talent, on our team, uh, having great leadership there with Michael Robinson was incredible. I mean, uh, obviously we had a really great football team, but, um, you know, just, just a lot of fun to do that as freshmen for, for myself, Dion Butler, Derek Williams. Um, I mean, our whole freshman class, honestly, but Justin King, uh, Lydell, you know, just, just a chance to, to see firsthand what we could do and then all the way, you know, kind of grow towards 2008 and that spread HD and, and set the stage for our, you know, kind of a new era of Penn State football that looked a little different. Um, you know, just an honor to, um, you know, to be a part of those teams and win some football games. Jordan, I'm fortunate to come from a big family, really close knit, and things sometimes can get competitive. It could be at a Christmas game. It could be at whatever. But look, your family is next level. All right. You got you winning a Super Bowl. Your brother Gabe was in the final four with George Mason. Your brother Levi won the Big 12 title at Baylor and your brother-in-law, Michael Taylor, won a World Series with the Nationals. Is it basketball pickup games? Is it Monopoly? You know, give us an inside look at, at your family, at when the competitive juices start flowing the most when you all get together. Uh, yeah, it's, it's when a basketball rolls out on the court. I mean, that, that's for sure. That's when, uh, when the hard fouls come out, you know, the emotion. Uh, and, it's, and it's always been that way. I mean, for my older brother and I, we're a year apart. Um, you know, that started when we were four and five years old playing on the, you know, the little tykes hoops. I mean, I was usually the one that was uh, that would end up crying at the end of the game. But, um, you know, that's that's definitely what uh, a big part of what built me is those competitive moments uh, in the family. Um, you know, my younger brother, Zach, uh, is also a six five lanky hooper. Uh, so we, we roll the roll the ball out and play 21. Um you know, somebody still might end up crying at the end of that. <laughs> so, Jordan, let's shift a little bit off the field. While you were here at Penn State, you were you were really a great student. Um, how much the demands of this program and the life lessons you learned at Penn State helped you both as an NFL player and certainly in your professional life? It's, um, you know, invaluable. Not only, I mean, not only the education that I got at Penn State. Um, I got my degree in advertising there and was a Spanish minor. Um, but even beyond the education itself, it's just the relationships and, um, you know, the professors that you kind of take for granted and, um, you know, counselors and, and football staff and coaches, um, everybody in the football office, um, you know, a whole lot of relationships that, um, you know, I carry with me and have a chance to, um, you know, reconnect with this weekend and, um, you know, there's just so much value in the university, the alumni network um, that's really, you know, in, in enabled me to succeed off the field, I'd say. Well, Jordan, let me ask you, you got any last minute wishes to put on the pads and play for PSU this weekend against the Bruins? Oh, man. <laughs> wishes? I don't, I don't know if wishes is the right word. I, I did like a, a halftime flag football game at the Cleveland Browns game last week and I, I lasted all of the three minutes that we played uh, and, and not a second more. So I don't, I don't think I got the juice in the tank. Really appreciate Jordan taking time for us to be our impact interview. We have much more at NittanyGameWeek.com, including his answer to being a freelance photographer. Really, really interesting stuff. We need to step aside from the TV show for a quick break. Make sure you go to NittanyGameWeek.com for the entire conversation with Jordan Norwood, along with our other web-exclusive content, like our depth chart in Nittany Game Week podcast. When we come back, it's time to hand out some hardware. It was a team effort, but this guy was at times a one-man wrecking crew, a very deserving and versatile scrap metal winner. When we come back, we're heading into the final minutes on Nittany Game Week. Scrap Metal is sponsored by the We Are In, voted number one game day restaurant in Center County. Follow us on Facebook and visit thewearein.com or call for dinner or room reservations. Tom, let's talk scrap metal winner, and I can see your eyes light up every time you give this award to a defensive player. Yeah, it's about time we get back to the defensive players. And junior defensive end and linebacker, Abdul Calder from LaSalle College High School in Philadelphia. 
He was credited with seven tackles against Illinois, including four of them solo, four tackles for a loss, two sacks, a forced fumble. I could go on and on. And a pass breakup. He was all over the field playing both defensive end and linebacker. The strip sack came in the fourth quarter and sealed the win for the Nittany Lions. He now has over 20 tackles for a loss in his career, and it's his third game with two or more sacks. More importantly, he has the Scrap Metal Award. All right, time for our quiz, trivia time. Last week's question was who, which Penn State quarterback tied the Memorial Stadium record for scoring and throwing touchdowns against Illinois. Michael Robinson was our winner, and our winner is Doug Hill from Shippensburg, Pennsylvania. And let's go on to this week's. It's UCLA-themed. UCLA last played in State College on September, uh, October 7th of 1967. Uh, Penn State lost that game to number four Bruins and did not lose a game until September 26th of 1970, a span of 1,085 days. How many games were in that Penn State's unbeaten streak? Answer at NittanyGameWeek.com. All right, somebody's going to be doing some math. In addition to a television show, we're bringing Nittany Lions together with our depth chart at NittanyGameWeek.com. We're connecting businesses that support the show with our viewers, and our goal is to build a team that keeps our hometowns strong. If you haven't noticed yet, we have a lot to share with you when it comes to college football. It doesn't all fit into this 30-minute window. Make sure to check out NittanyGameWeek.com for all of our web-exclusive content. We always finish with some pride picks. Keep them coming at NittanyGameWeek.com. Make sure you submit them to show us your spirit. For Jay and Tom, I'm Todd. Thanks so much for watching Nittany Game Week. We'll see you next time.